Aaron Hernandez, once an All-American football star, now sits behind bars. He had once been on trial for murder. His star has fallen. Everything he once had right at his fingertips, the $40 million NFL contract, the comforts of a mansion, his freedom, everything was gone in an instant. This one-time tight end, who had the potential for legendary greatness in his sport, was about to face the biggest battle of his life. He was going to fight to prove his innocence. Reporters camped outside the Bristol County Courthouse, eager to find out what charges Aaron would face. Remember, at this point, the public was still in the dark when it came to the specific details. It wasn't yet known exactly what Aaron's involvement had been. Now the judge had spoken. He was being charged with first-degree murder. On this episode, we'll take you inside the intense murder trial of Aaron Hernandez. It was a trial that would pull back the curtain on Aaron's questionable lifestyle. It would also pit two loving sisters against each other, one on the side of the prosecution and one on the side of the defense. This case would ensure that Aaron's name would truly never be forgotten, but not in the way he might have hoped. You're listening to... The Fall of a Hero, From Football to Murder, Mystery and Murder, Analysis by Dr. Phil. I'm Dr. Phil. Green Chef is the first USDA-certified organic meal kit company. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from. Love switching it up? Now you can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Choosing Green Chef means choosing real foods that support a healthy lifestyle. You can count on meals that are good for your body. Green Chef offers unique farm-fresh ingredients and premium proteins. The beef tenderloin with tomato shallot sauce. Now this is a restaurant-worthy meal that's guaranteed to wow. The paleo-friendly meal is fantastic and simple to make. Robin and I have fun creating Green Chef meals. It fits perfectly with our diet and lifestyle. So go to greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. The number one meal kit for eating well. Once Aaron was arrested, New England effectively turned their backs on him. Die-hard Patriot fans who once proudly sported his jersey were now throwing it away or trading it in. All at once, the name Aaron Hernandez meant something very, very different. Meanwhile, it was shocking to those that knew him just how well he was adjusting to being locked up. He talked to his fiancée, my former guest, Shayana Jenkins, quite often. On one of their recorded calls, he was heard telling her that his jail cell was cozy. On a call with his mother, Terry, Aaron said, Jail doesn't bother me. I've been the most relaxed and less stressed in jail than I have out of jail. Now, of course, you have to ask, how on earth was this guy happier in jail, more relaxed in jail? It's kind of disturbing to imagine that being removed from society might give someone comfort. I mean, think about it. He was living in this huge mansion. He had everything at his fingertips, so much disposable income, he could have anything that he could even imagine. This is when we can start to peel back the layers on him. As a child, his father Dennis gave him structure. His father, who by all accounts was strict, even abusive, kept him on track for football greatness. Then football gave him structure in college. He had this focus and his plan on getting into the NFL. Then he got what he wanted. He was drafted by the Patriots. It seems like even though he had reached the top, he was still missing something. He sought solace in drug and gang activity. He was smoking tons of weed and gravitating towards a bad crowd. Now, understand, when you go to the NFL, The philosophy is, 
these are men, not boys. We treat them like men, not boys. We're not going to be parents for them. We expect them to police themselves, to discipline themselves, to run their own lives. And the Patriots, it seems like even though he had reached the top, didn't give him what he needed in terms of structure. So all of a sudden, he's now in jail, and while he might have had a pitiful routine, he at least had the structure that he had been missing in the short time he had been with the Patriots. And the pressure of life has at least temporarily been put on hold. He didn't have to make decisions. He didn't have to make all of the choices and deal with the freedom that most people would think they wanted. He recounted prison meals and didn't seem disgusted. Everything was taken care of for him. He didn't have to worry about tackles or touchdowns or about his labile emotions. And let's face it, he was a celebrity in jail. So it wasn't like he was a faceless man in a crowd. As both sides prepared for trial, they knew what they were up against. Now, this may have seemed like an open and shut case because of all the evidence that linked him to the murder, but the prosecution still had their work cut out for them. The question remained, why would he do this? What was the motive? Why would he have wanted Odin dead? And certainly, why would it be so important for him to have him dead that he would jeopardize everything he had worked for all of his life? Jeopardize his $40 million contract? Jeopardize this love he had for Shayanna? All the things that most people would say were the ultimate success. It just didn't make sense. The other million-dollar question, maybe multi-million-dollar question, concerned the murder weapon. Where was the gun? Cops had searched Aaron's property to no avail. Without a confirmed murder weapon, could they really tie him to this? When the prosecution made their opening statement, they decided to shine light on Odin, not Aaron. They described him as a caring brother. They reminded jurors and the court that he was only 27 years old and his whole life was stretched out ahead of him. The DA then went into the details of how he was brutally shot, that based on where he was wounded made it seem like he had been cowering or crouching, defenseless. That's important because it means he was not posing a threat at the time. He was retreating. He was defenseless. These details were too much for his mother to bear. She was quite understandably flooded with emotions and had to leave the courtroom. It was a powerful moment that emphasized just how profound this loss was. People loved Odin. People cared about him. He wasn't just a name. He just wasn't a body laying on the street. He was a member of a family. He was loved by people. And the prosecution was saying that Aaron had taken his life. The prosecution went on to outline what they described as evidence that they said overwhelmingly pointed to Aaron's guilt. Yes, there was surveillance video, but even more damning than that was DNA. Not far from Odin's body, officers had found a half-smoked marijuana cigarette that matched Aaron's DNA. The other DNA evidence was found on the blue bubble gum in the trash from the rental car. Aaron's DNA was once again present, along with that missing sixth shell casing. If the defense was nervous, they didn't show it. They came out guns blazing. In their words, Aaron was being targeted because he was a celebrity. His attorney claimed that once police knew that Aaron's friend had been killed, that he had stood no chance. He was being unfairly targeted. The friend of a celebrity had been murdered, so go after the celebrity. Make your bones right here. This is where you can get your name in the paper, prosecutors. This is where you can really score a big, big headline. And then when you decide to jump to the defense side of the docket, everybody will know your name. Remember, 
Theoretically, the burden of proof is not on the defense. Theoretically, the prosecution has to prove what happened. What the defense needs to do is create reasonable doubt, theoretically. They are there to make sure that they can poke holes in a prosecution's case in order to show the jury that if there is even a shred of reasonable doubt in their minds, that they cannot, in good conscience, convict a defendant. The defense is also there to remind the jury of their client's good qualities. Aaron's a father, a football star, a good friend. He doesn't have a reason to jeopardize that. Now, why do I say theoretically? I say theoretically because I've spent much of my professional career in the litigation arena, and I can tell you that while that sounds good to say, that you're innocent until proven guilty, that the burden of proof is on the prosecution, that in fact I have learned that jurors have a very different attitude. Jurors tend to have the attitude that, look, we're down here. We've come all this way. Why would we be here if there wasn't something to it? Old sayings get to be old sayings because they're profound. And the old saying, where there's smoke, there's fire, really resonates with jurors. They're thinking, okay, look, we're down here, the judge is down here, we're in this big fancy courtroom, there's all this wood, there's those flags hanging up there, that big seal behind the judge, everybody's wearing suits, they're spending lots of money on this. Would they really do that if they didn't have the right guy? I mean, they have hundreds of detectives, wouldn't they have figured this out before now? They don't want to come down here and be embarrassed. So defense, if he didn't do it, if we're not down here for the reason the prosecution says we are, then you need to give me an alternative explanation of why we are down here. If we're not down here because of what that DA says, then you need to tell me why we are down here. Don't just expect me to sit here and say, well, he didn't tell a good enough story, so your guy goes home. No, no, no. If we're not down here for the reason the prosecution is giving me, you better give me an alternative explanation. And that's a pretty steep hill to climb. Now, Aaron's attorneys seem to understand that. And they made sure to keep repeating that he was good friends with Odin. They smoked marijuana together. They were in serious relationships with sisters. They were going to be family one day. Why would Aaron want to suddenly kill him in cold blood? They were giving an alternative explanation, which was, these were friends. These were future family members. During this time, you could cut the tension in the courtroom with a knife. The last time there was this much division was arguably during the O.J. Simpson trial. Shayana Jenkins was supporting Aaron while her sister Shania was mourning the loss of Odin. They were seated on opposite sides of the courtroom. Sisters, which only added to the ever-evolving drama of this story. There were sisters torn apart by murder and tragedy, and also by mystery. Whatever had happened that night, one thing was for sure. It seemed to have permanently divided these sisters. It seemed to have permanently torn them apart. When Shayana claimed during the trial that she was not close to Shania, this was her sister. There is a home video showing them embracing right after the news of Odin's death. There was a relationship there. After all, they were the reason Odin and Aaron had become friends in the first place. They were sisters. They'd grown up together. This murder divided them and caused mistrust. How could it not? Shania was trying to seek justice for her murdered boyfriend while Shayana was doing everything possible to keep her fiancé from going down for that murder. And look, when you're on opposite sides of this kind of a dispute, when the stakes are so high... It can really breed resentment. I mean, here's two women in love. One of their lovers is dead. The other one is facing life in prison. It's a situation where they were both going through unimaginable pain. 
but they couldn't comfort each other. They couldn't turn to each other. So they were on islands. They were isolated. The defense was quick to try to discredit the evidence from the police investigation, of course. They focused on how morning rain the day of Odin's body was found could have interfered with the crime scene and how it was processed. They were also quick to try to bring up details that police might have overlooked. For example, during a cross-examination, one of Aaron's lawyers brought up that investigators hadn't measured how far the shell casings were from Odin's body. The defense was inferring that if this wasn't correctly processed, what else might have been bungled by police? The prosecution knew they needed to at least try to show that Aaron was angry with Odin. They needed to provide a motive, and so far, nothing solid had come to light. So they called a witness to the stand. A man named Kwame Nicholas. Kwame supported the prosecution's theory that Aaron had been livid with his so-called good friend for days. And this supported the prosecution's story that his anger with Odin had festered until he snapped. Kwame testified that a couple of nights prior to Odin's murder, they were all at the same club and that he saw Aaron staring intensely at Odin. Kwame said on the stand, and I quote, he was staring at him and he looked like he was upset. He just looked tense, like something was amiss, like his eyes were beaming directly at Odin. Okay, but why was Aaron angry? Well, Kwame didn't know, and it just seems odd to me, I have to tell you, that they even allowed that testimony, because that's an awful lot of speculation. I don't know what Kwame's training is on reading people's eyes, but that seems like a lot of projection of what he thought being projected onto the eyes of Aaron Hernandez. Unfortunately for the prosecution, the defense was ready to pounce on Kwame over his statement. He had previously given police a different version of events, saying that he hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary between Aaron and Odin. When this was pointed out, he had to concede that, yes, now his story was different. Aaron's lawyers were certainly doing their best to dispel the idea that he had any kind of beef with Odin. Now things seemed even more muddled. Two versions of the same story, well... That just wasn't helping the prosecution establish a solid explanation for Aaron murdering Odin. They might have been a lot better off if they had never called Kwame. The defense lawyer continued to eviscerate Kwame on the stand over his claim that he saw Aaron glaring at Odin. Quote, Are you familiar with Aaron's expressions or what he does with his face he fired at him? When Kwame tried to respond that he knew how to read facial expressions, the lawyer fired back, that wasn't my question. By the time the defense got through with him, Kwame's account didn't seem at all credible. Notable characters continued to testify, including Patriots owner Robert Kraft. But it was the Jenkins sisters who everyone wanted to hear from. And both women were going to take the stand. When Odin's girlfriend, Shania, took the stand for the prosecution, the pain she was feeling was palpable. While her answers were clear, it was evident that the loss of her boyfriend had deeply impacted her. She broke down into tears as she recounted the moment she discovered that the man she thought she would marry had been killed had been taken from her in the blink of an eye. One of the most interesting parts of Shania's testimony was when she recalled her encounter with Aaron shortly after the murder. She had, of course, gone to her sister, Shayana's house, for comfort. She was looking for a soft place to fall. She went to the people that she knew would comfort her. Of course, not yet knowing that Aaron was most likely involved. His behavior at the time struck her as odd. 
She noticed he wasn't crying, he wasn't emotional. He merely patted her on the back and told her that he had been through this death thing before and that she would get over it. Then he just vanished and she didn't see him again. It was as if he was intentionally steering clear of her. Now, to me, this just doesn't pass muster in terms of an appropriate emotional reaction. If your good friend has been murdered and you see that your future sister-in-law is devastated, you just don't pop in, mumble a condolence, a few platitudes, and make a quick exit. Not unless you have something really important to do. Like something to hide. Like a cover-up to put together. Shania recalled that Cheyana wasn't behaving normally either. She recalled her sister getting calls on her cell phone multiple times. Whenever she would get a phone call, Shania noticed that her answers were short as though she didn't want to give away what she was talking about. Not only did Cheyenne sound suspicious, she kept going back and forth to the basement of the mansion to make these calls. Talk about suspicious behavior. I mean, why would you leave the room, go downstairs into the basement, completely isolated, to make a simple phone call? The last time Shania saw her sister go down to the basement, she had an empty black garbage bag. When she returned upstairs... Shania saw through a window that her sister was carrying a now full garbage bag. The next time she sees her sister, she's empty-handed. Whatever she was doing in that basement, whatever she might have had, it's now gone. Of course, what the prosecution was inferring was that Shayana was helping Aaron dispose of the gun used to kill Odin. Another intriguing witness for the prosecution was Aaron and Shayana's nanny, Jennifer. She testified that she too had been at the Boston nightclub two nights before Odin's murder, and she had a hell of a story about the type of guy Aaron was. She claimed that Aaron took her and her friend back to the apartment he kept. She claimed he tried to kiss her, but that she stopped him, saying it was wrong and that she couldn't do this. Why? Well, because she was his daughter's nanny. Obviously, this is yet another tidbit the prosecution laid out to show the jury that Aaron was capable of unsavory and selfish behavior. He was not on trial for cheating on his fiance. He wasn't on trial for any kind of adultery. He was on trial for murder. But if you can destroy someone's character in one area... It sure makes it easier to believe that they're not of good moral character in another area. So if that's true, it's a pretty sleazy story. They were saying that not only was he willing to stray, he didn't even care if it was the person who cared for his child who knew his fiance, who he knew they were going to be in the same room together probably the very next morning. Pretty brazen. At this point, Shayana had yet to testify, and some wondered if this type of humiliation would sway her into going against him. Now, she knew Aaron had strayed in the past, and she had stayed. But now the stakes were higher than ever. Finally, she did take the stand. It was a pivotal moment in the case that shocked those who were there. This was where the prosecution was going to try to address the case of that missing gun. Would they be able to get Shayana to admit that she had in fact helped conceal the weapon responsible for Odin's death? When Shayana took the stand, you could hear a pin drop in the courtroom. She appeared polished and solemn. It would soon become clear that she had no intention of betraying her fiancé. She was choosing to be loyal to him over her own flesh and blood. That was her level of devotion to him. Shayana had already been through quite a bit for him before this murder trial had taken place. She had been called to testify before a grand jury. 
she had been caught lying for Aaron, which is a highly punishable offense that could have very well resulted in her getting jail time. As part of a deal she struck with prosecutors, Shayana had to take the stand in Aaron's murder trial. She was being compelled. There was no way out. The pressure was on. She knew she had to do this not only to protect him, but to protect herself. This was the only way she could avoid getting slammed with a perjury charge. Things weren't exactly roses between her and Aaron at this point. She wasn't under the impression that he was an altar boy. She knew him like the back of her hand. She knew he cheated. Most believe she knew he did drugs. Now he was on trial for murder. He was putting her through hell. Would she flip? Would she spill the secrets that investigators and state prosecutors were certain she knew? When you listen to Shayana's testimony and observe her demeanor, you have to give her some credit. She didn't waver. She kept her composure, and the general impression seemed to be that she was keeping the truth under lock and key. She conceded that yes, Aaron had called her the day that she was with her sister shortly after Odin's murder. The story she recounted was that Aaron had asked her to dispose of a box in the basement. A box, Shayana stated, smelled like skunk. She laid out a story that made it seem like Aaron, in anticipation of a future police search, was telling his fiancée to help him get rid of his weed supply. In the midst of a murder investigation that Aaron seemed so closely connected to, I think it's safe to say looking for pot wasn't at the forefront of the investigators' minds. But this was her version of the events. In addition, Shayana claimed she never asked him what was in the box. Now, that's a little hard to believe. If someone tells you to throw away a secret box in the basement, I don't know, wouldn't the first question out of your mouth be, yeah, what's in the box? It's just human nature. Not only did she say she didn't ask him what was inside the box, she stated that she never even opened it. Well, I guess Pandora sure could have taken a few lessons from Shayana if that's true. Any person worth their salt would ask what's in this box or would just look themselves. Her feigning ignorance just doesn't compute in this situation. It's just downright bizarre. I wasn't buying what she was selling, and it just seemed far-fetched to me that the jury would either. Now, look, these two had known each other forever. But it seemed like Aaron had control of this relationship. He could be unfaithful to her or be a poor partner to her. And he saw that she would just stay. I always say, you show people how you want to be treated. When you choose to stay with someone who repeatedly wrongs you or puts you in a position where you have to lie for them, you tell them this behavior is acceptable when you stay. She had known this man since she was in school. It's likely that this on-again, off-again relationship had shaped her. People change. People evolve for better or worse. And she may have kept an image of him in her head for so long, the image of the man she fell in love with, that she just couldn't reconcile with the man who was now before her, the man who was facing a murder charge. You know, I often wondered if she was in love with the man she wished he was instead of the man he was. If she had romanticized him, if she had idolized him in such a way that she had him on some pedestal and was just functionally blind to who he was and how he treated her. Nonetheless, Let's get back to her testimony. The most odd part of the story had to be the end. So to recap, Cheyenne states that she got a call from Aaron. She doesn't ask him what's in the box. She doesn't look inside the box. And then she just goes and disposes of the box in a dumpster. Okay. All right. Let's say we're with her up until this point. Which dumpster? Where's the dumpster? Her response? I don't exactly remember where it was located. Think about this scenario. 
I call you up. I tell you I need you to get rid of a box. You ask nothing about what's in it. You don't look to see what's in it. And then you throw this box away, yet the location you dump this mystery box in just slipped your mind. Now, you're in this neighborhood where you live. You know the neighborhood. You know the streets. This just doesn't add up. If she wasn't doing herself any favors with this account, she certainly wasn't doing Aaron any either. It just wasn't believable. The defense had to have known that her testimony would raise eyebrows. Just what was going on between these two? Well, they set out to explain. They brought up Aaron's former infidelity, which had previously caused the couple to have what could have been an irreversible falling out. According to Shayana, she made the decision to move back in with him. She said from that point forward that she made the decision that when it came to Aaron, quote, I would have to compromise on his behavior, and that included infidelity and everything that came along with it. And I decided that it was worth fighting for, end quote. This was the defense's way of showing that this whole box debacle made sense if you understood Shayana's character and their relationship. When it came to her man, she was going to go along to get along and wasn't the type to challenge him or ask questions about whatever business he had going on. It seemed like she was once again avoiding the truth under oath in order to protect this man that she loved unconditionally. It was clear they weren't going to get to the bottom of things with Shayana, but look at it this way. From the defense standpoint, as non-credible as this seemed, she didn't give him anything. She had a story that, while unbelievable, it didn't really put a nail in the coffin because they didn't get any proof out of it. The jury could say, I didn't believe her, that I don't think she did not know what was in that box. I think she did know what was in the box. But they don't speculate about what's in the box. They can think that the gun was in the box. But as I've said on many occasions before, when a lawyer thinks, well, we didn't get an admission, we didn't get her to say what was in the box, but the jury could infer it. You're just pipe dreaming. Juries make decisions on what they see and hear, not on what they don't see and hear. And she never said the words. And this trial is going to go on for days and weeks. And when it gets to the end, her testimony is basically going to be a non-event. They didn't get anything out of her, she didn't give them anything, and they have nothing to look up and go back to. So while it was clear they weren't going to get to the bottom of things with Shayana, prosecution had other tricks up their sleeve. They pulled up home security footage from Aaron's house the night of the murder. The footage outside the house shows that within 10 minutes of Odin's murder, Aaron and his buddies, Ernest Wallace and Carlos Ortiz, were back at the mansion. And not only that, the footage also seemed to show Aaron carrying something black in his hand. He was holding something that looked an awful lot like a gun. The prosecution even got a Glock firearm expert to take the stand to tell the jury that it sure looked like a Glock to him. This firearm expert's testimony seemed effective, but he was looking at an image on screen not in real life. Again, this wasn't a crystal clear image. It was security footage. The defense, of course, honed in on that fact. They pointed out that he was making this ID based on a grainy video clip. The defense then took it a step further, accusing him of confirmation bias. This is the tendency to draw conclusions based on what you already know and what you think you know. The point being, you're programmed to see what you believe is going to be there. The firearm witness had no choice. He had to concede that this could be possible. 
to test this out in your own mind, ask yourself this. If they had just shown 10 videotapes from security cameras with somebody carrying something in their hand with no context whatsoever, is it likely this firearms expert would have identified that image as a Glock in that person's hand if he wasn't already looking for it because of the context of this story? And if the answer is no, there's not enough there to have concluded that, then you have to assume that he was influenced, programmed by confirmation bias. One by one, the defense was doing its best to attempt to disprove every piece of evidence that seemed to spell out guilty. And they weren't finished yet. Now they were going to try to address the DNA evidence. The defense called their forensic expert to the stand, and this expert had a completely different take on the DNA evidence that supposedly tied Aaron to the crime scene. She claimed that the reason Aaron's chewed gum was with the shell casing was because they had been tossed out together and that one didn't necessarily have anything to do with the other. The defense was hoping that a jury would conclude that just because the gum was next to the shell casing didn't mean that Aaron was at the murder scene and put them on the ground together. Now, obviously, that's asking the jury to suspend common sense, suspend disbelief, that they just randomly showed up there together. The defense only called three witnesses. It seemed like Aaron and his team, well, it just seemed like there was a lot of confidence on that side of the room. The trial had been going on for four months. Finally, in April of 2015, it was time for closing arguments. Now, understand, when a trial goes on for four months, there's a lot of decay in memory about what's been presented. Jurors are allowed to take notes. They can write down something if it really stuck out to them or if it was really significant. They can also ask the court to give them copies of documents or a transcript of what happened. But clearly, something that they heard four months ago Well, it just kind of gets mixed in, and that's what the defense is hoping for. They're hoping that it all just becomes wallpaper. That's why closing arguments are so important. This is the chance for both parties to drive their version home. Now, I know you're not interested in becoming a lawyer, but let me contrast this to opening statements. In opening statements, all a lawyer is allowed to do is tell you what they believe the evidence is going to show. They can't argue. They can't say, we believe the evidence is going to show A, B, and C, and that will prove thus and so. All they can do is say, we believe the evidence will show and you will hear that he was here that this was this, that that was that. All they can do is tell you what is coming up. Preview the case. But once you get to closing arguments, now you can argue the case. You can talk about what evidence came in. And this is related to opening statements in a very important way. If the defense or the prosecution promised you something in opening statement, if they said, we're going to show you beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was the killer, we're going to give you evidence that is so clear, we're going to bring you a smoking gun, did they pay that off? Did they write a check they can't cash? Or did they make good on their promise? And in closing arguments, the other side will say, you heard them stand up and say they were going to prove this, and they never did it. 
So by their own standards, they failed their burden of proof. In closing arguments, you get to argue your case, why the evidence that you presented should lead them to the conclusion you want. Each side recaps what they have presented and what they think it proves. It's the chance for the jury to once again be affected emotionally by the victim or the victims in the case. It's about the facts, but it's also the argument. This is also where passion comes in. This is also where you can really tell the story. The defense did their job, no question about it. They planted that seed of doubt. They asked the jury, why would Aaron have killed Odin right in his hometown? Why would he leave the keys to his rental car in Odin's pocket? Also, that joint found at the scene of the crime, it had Aaron and Odin's DNA on it. They had shared it. Why take a puff of the magic dragon as a prelude to murder? Let's get high so I can kill you? Defense attorney James Sultan wasn't done there. The whole trial, he had been focused on establishing doubt. Now, he dropped the bombshell admitting that yes, Aaron was there. All that stuff you heard about maybe the gum got there and the shell casing got there in some random fashion, you can't conclude because of that that he was there. He reverses field here and says, Aaron was there. But he was a victim himself, a witness to the horrible killing of his good friend, Odin Lloyd. The wheels on this train had come to a screeching and unexpected turn. The closing statement now told a bombshell. This was a 23-year-old kid that had witnessed something, a shocking killing committed by someone he knew. According to defense attorney Sultan, it was Aaron's two pals, Ernest and Carlos, who were high on PCP and went crazy and murdered Odin because they were high on drugs. Well, now this story is certainly a horse of a different color. Poor Aaron. He was a victim. He had to witness the murder of his future brother-in-law. He had to witness the murder of his good friend. How traumatic must that have been for him? You saw how upset he was when Shayana's sister came over and said he had been killed. He patted her on the back and said, well, you'll get over it, and left. But now they're arguing that he was terribly traumatized by it. Well, the prosecution's closing argument immediately refuted this account. They weren't concerned so much anymore with proving a motive. Instead of focusing on what Aaron's motive could have been, they highlighted his hubris. The defense says the police targeted Aaron because he was a celebrity. Not so, the prosecution retorted. According to their argument, it was Aaron's celebrity that caused him to think that he could get away with committing murder. That's why he was sloppy with DNA and details like leaving keys in Odin's pocket, because he thought the rules would not apply to him. He was above the law. He was a big deal. This was simply arrogance on his part. How dare they charge him with murder? He was Aaron Hernandez. The case that had taken over the media was coming to a close. It was the time for jury deliberations. Days went by and the suspense was mounting. Would the jury be deadlocked? Would they find him innocent? Finally, the jury had reached a verdict. Aaron Hernandez was found guilty. His fiance and her mother Terry sobbed. Aaron he remained poker-faced, showing no emotion. Remember, he said he kind of liked it in jail. I asked Shayana during our sit-down if Aaron had seen that coming, if he thought he was going to be convicted. When he went through trial and 
He was found guilty and he got his sentence. Was that a shock to him? Did he think he was going to be found not guilty and go home? I think it was a shock to all of us. We were definitely leaning more towards an innocent verdict. Do you think he was involved in that crime in some way? I truly don't. I've said it over and over. He may have been at the wrong place, wrong time, but I don't think that he, you know, what is said to be out there is actually accurate. The wrong place at the wrong time. That was how she chose to view his involvement. No one wins in a case like this. The people who loved Odin are not going to get him back. The hours after the guilty verdict was read, the judge announced Aaron's sentence. Life without the possibility of parole. He might have just been sentenced to life behind bars, but this wasn't the end of the public's fascination with Aaron. He had many more secrets that had been buried deep for years. And the public couldn't get enough of hearing about them. On our next episode, we'll talk about the next piece of outrageous news in this saga, Aaron's other deadly brush with the law. We'll also get more in-depth regarding what might have made Aaron do the things that he did. Why was he so troubled? And why did he seem to have a habit of destroying the lives of those who got close to him? And still to come is more on my in-depth interview with his fiance. This was still only the beginning of the trials and tribulations she would face. It's all coming up next. You've been listening to The Fall of a Hero, From Football to Murder, Mystery and Murder, Analysis by Dr. Phil. I'm Dr. Phil.